Good afternoon, everyone. Just, just like last week, I think it's a bit of a theme. There have been a number of guests that I've spoken with and gone back and forth with for an extended period of time. Uh, nice to see that the Kali Yuga is not holding everybody down today. We have someone who I think our first interaction was last, like, I think October, or November or something yeah. like that. So it's been a long time coming, but we've both been busy and both very excited to get into what you've been up to. Everybody, welcome. Prasita, very happy to be speaking with you today. Hi, guys. Nityanandam, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to, yeah, finally make this happen and, and chat about everything. Of course, of course. I mean, just, just, I think we're both from the same area, like the LA based area. So things yeah. are always moving real quick around here. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I've noticed, I think around the time that we actually had our first interaction was when I was uh, personally like introduced to uh, Buddhism and meditation and like mm -hmm. in a, in a more solid way outside of the very, I would say informal way that we kind of look at it here in the West. It's uh, we don't yeah. take the spiritual side of it too seriously, at least not as much, but there definitely has been like a, I wouldn't say a, a boom, but um, a bit more of a rise in popularity with that sort of with Hinduism and Buddhism. Like it's starting to become yeah. a little more accepted here. It's like whoa. Definitely slowly, but surely it's definitely growing and expanding piece by piece. <laughs> Yeah, at least legitimate forms of it. You know, we have a habit here in the West of, and this is something that I've uh, spoken with about quite a few different practitioners, um, how we have a way of not corrupting it, mm -hmm. but we take our Western perception of religion, you know, things being yeah. very black and white, and we, we sort of use that to demean the, uh, mm -hmm. the purity of the culture that we're taking, you know, we're taking as our own. So I'm yeah, very that's a great point. <laughs> I, I yeah. totally agree. <laughs> So naturally, when it comes to that, like you, when you run into people who are like I, I myself am, I consider myself, you know, pagan. People who tend to follow spiritual paths like that that aren't the mainstream ones, they tend to have very interesting stories as to how they led up to that. So like usually you don't find a whole. I think I just spoke about this last week. You don't find a whole lot of people who identify as Buddhist who are just like, yeah, I was born into it and I was raised. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> no, you have you tend to have a more fascinating story behind it. So I'd love to ask you, uh, being we're from the same generation around the same age range. Yeah. How did you get started with all that? Yeah, <laughs> it's such a funny story. You're right. I think definitely as a, as a Westerner, right. We, that's not a normal thing for us to be raised in. Although I have met a handful of people now that, that were born into it, but yeah, most are not. And I was definitely not. I was raised Catholic my entire life and uh, you too. <laughs> uh, Christian. But Christian sort yeah, of around yeah, the same yeah, exactly. I mean, and I was just having a conversation with, about this the other day with somebody um, that it's like our culture, right? It's become our culture. So no, even if you're not very religious um, in America in general, we are, we're a Christian nation, whether we want to admit that or not. And it's the majority and it's the norm and it's part of, it's integrated into our culture, our holidays, our understandings of everything. Um, but I was also raised very, very religious in a lot of ways and very traditional going to actually going to church every single Sunday and I went to Catholic school until high school so I was in the system <laughs> in the, really really in the system and um, being you know indoctrinated from a very young age and although um, I definitely don't view it as you know negative or positive I think that it was it was needed for whatever reason I chose that experience in this life um, it brought me a lot of lessons I definitely think that there's a lot of things which I, I was able to still connect in my own way to spirituality, but I think just internally, right, as children, I think like we have that in us to, to connect and to feel that divine presence, whatever form that might be, and I felt that, so even though I was in this system that I didn't agree with, especially as I got older and older, and I started to question, oh, that doesn't sit well with me, I don't understand why God would be that way, or why, you know, we would do things this way, and I don't see love behind these teachings, that kind of a thing. Um, I was still able to have spirituality, but it was so deeply, um, deeply ingrained in me to not question uh, my religion. And that if anything, if you are doubting it and stuff, there's something inherently wrong with you. You know, you're, that concept of evil and even the concept that's pushed in you as like you're born a sinner that in itself is extremely damaging to a person's consciousness I think um, at a deeper level but at the empowerment level right so we question we, we live in a lot of fear and we question our own questioning and our own expansion 
So I was in that phase for a while. My brother started his journey much younger than me, actually, at around 14, probably, or so, like very young. And he was very rebellious. He was the rebellious one against the system, you know? Like, yeah, <laughs> he, was, he was like, I don't, I'm not doing school. I'm not doing church. I'm not doing any of this, any of this BS. And I was, I was the one that was fitting in perfectly, doing my best to do that, to be, the, to be that kind of kid. Um, but it took me moving uh, actually out of the country. And so after high school, I took a gap year. And I lived in Ecuador for a year in, uh, in a little village with a host family and very isolated, like no, obviously nobody spoke English even in my village. I barely knew Spanish. So um, coming into it, I was isolated in every way possible. You know, I couldn't even communicate my needs. And um, that is what really kickstarted my spiritual journey because I started to have this space outside of all of the identities that had been, you know, pushed on me my whole life and outside of my friends, outside of my family and my community to really question who I was and what I believed. And I started to do that. And I started to read and I started to meditate every day. And I started to, you know, journal and I was in nature every day for the job that I did. So it opened up a lot of doorways for me to, to start que that questioning. And at the end of the year, I ended up being very intrigued and drawn to the Eastern path in general. So I was into Buddhism a lot. I was into very, very like the surface, surface level of Hinduism, but I hadn't really do do dove in yet. And then my brother was like, hey, sis, I'm going to India. You got to come with me. <laughs> and I was like, you're crazy. I've, I've been gone for an entire year. Like I'm ready to get back to my family and my boyfriend and everyone I love, you know, and um, some part of me, one day I was like, I have to go. Like, I can't say no. And I don't know what that part was. And now I feel like I do. But at the time, I was like, I don't know why I'm making this decision. And I said yes. And so I got home two days later, I got on a plane for another month to India. So I was just gone again. And we went to this program, this yoga and meditation program there, um, under an enlightened master who is now my guru. And that was, that was the beginning of everything. And it really, like, really healed and transformed me in ways that I cannot put put in words but also it answered so many of the burning questions that I had my whole life and opened up just more and more room for questioning and the freedom for questioning and the freedom for direct experience of spirituality um, and that's what you know connected me so much to it so that's kind of kind of how I landed on it and I was just I was so I think the biggest principle that really drew me to Hinduism um, as a lifestyle is was the value of ahimsa of nonviolence and living that to me was the ultimate that I was seeking you know um, and I wanted to continue and still do want to continue to embody that as the kind of core of my life you know so that's what that's what kind of in a nutshell how I ended up here well, uh, first and foremost, you have a really cool brother. Shout out to that guy. Yeah. Inviting yeah. on trips to India and stuff. It's funny. I actually uh, had something similar happen, except with my cousins. I went to um, England, Iceland, and Ireland last year. Oh, wow. And that, that's a very good point. You know, I mean, you were there for a year. So you mm -hmm. went to Ecuador, you had this experience, and you were separated completely from everything, like isolated for an entire year, living in a completely different part of the world with completely different values. Yeah. I did think it was interesting that you noted that your brother is older or younger. Are you around the same? He's younger, age? actually. Younger, okay. Younger. Uh -huh. So I think uh, what I've seen is specifically with our culture and the way that we express uh, religion, specifically like the Abrahamic faiths, mm. women specifically are hit with the hammer a little harder than men are. Yeah. Those values, like the the subservience and that sort That's of thing. Point, for actually, yeah. yeah, exactly. And then you look at like even within paganism and Hinduism, the mm -hmm. divine feminine is put on a much Very higher strong. pedestal, mm -hmm. much more strong. Again, yeah, exactly. Much more strong. And to me personally, that was one of the things that drew me to it was you yeah. have this system that we live in, like father, God, father, this yeah. it's all these masculine pronouns and these masculine conceptions of God referring to this and it, 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 the way that religion is expressed it's very dominant it's very con mm. it's conquering nature and then you look yeah. at these other yeah practices which look alien to us but <laughs> nonviolence, nurturing all these yeah. different sides of things it's uh, of course as naturally it's a lot more appealing especially if you live in this culture i couldn't <laughs> even imagine being a, a woman and having this perception just shoved down your throat your whole yeah, life yeah absolutely it fills you with a lot of 
it filled me with a lot of a lot of guilt and self hatred. Um, um, yeah, being in that and like that's a very good point actually. Um, yeah, as as that as a woman and even all these aspects of ourselves that we're told to deny, you know, throughout um, growing up, especially sexuality, sensuality, um, even desire, right? And like all of these ambition and and so many different aspects of you know the multi facetedness of who we all are and we're kind of told to shove that into a closet and not not ever talk about it or look at it and that idea that shame you know behind all of that and it is really liberating to to first discover right these these other paths you're like oh my god this is this is what I've been wanting you know and you see that upliftment and you see that balance between the masculine and feminine um, concepts of god concepts of ourselves concepts of the world and that you know that harmony that shiva shakti yin yang like you know concept um which which is so natural right like it seems it's so natural and so i think that's we're just drawn to it you know oh most definitely and i think specifically with this just the way that things have been going the last year we had a lot of these protests and specifically with our generation I think there's, it's pretty clear. You can see the ties between the drop in Abrahamic faiths, like the church attendance and all that. People are mm-hmm. identifying with other aspects and forms of spirituality, including Hinduism and paganism and all these yeah. ancient systems, which never really went away. They were just on the other side of the world. They're starting to rise mm-hmm. up here and you see all these social revolutions with things like sexuality, sensuality, the uh, elevation of the feminine, and you see yeah. all these different things. It's natural to see, of course, you're going to drop the religious um, attitude that informs the way that we express our identities Mm, within society and express yourself in a completely different form of spirituality. I think that's wonderful. Personally, I love seeing that. It's a lot more interesting. There's so much more variety and a lot more colors and a lot more. It's just a lot more acceptance. Yeah. And the spectrum of the spectrum of, yeah, that liberation of how we're allowed to express and connect in you know open source that's what like my guru calls it which i really love like an open source religion that is not there's no being or not being it there's no conversion there's no formal anything right or wrong moral code it's all a like very very open framework of understanding ourselves our understanding our place in all of this and understanding how we can experience the ultimate for ourselves, whether that be material desire, whether that be enlightenment, whether that be these higher states of consciousness or connection with the divine, right? It's it's all of these systems and sciences to do that um, versus like um, a moral code, you know? And it takes time and effort and work and practice to do those things. And mm-hmm. it's a lot harder to sell something if you don't have a label for it. Yeah, so right? It's, <laughs> yeah, it's like, I, who are you? What are you? I don't know. <laughs> Why are you trying to put me in a box like that? That's it's a lot less appealing to the the Western mind at first glance. But if you take a look at it, the work in itself is the reward. You don't need mm-hmm. the label, but that can be a very difficult thing for a lot of people out here to swallow. But yes, it's true. I think it has to do with, um, like you had mentioned, right? It's we've had we've had we've become dominated by um, the masculine way of thinking the left brain right like that whole idea is the is the map of what the society we're we're currently experiencing and we see not that that's all bad either but it's like it's become like overridden with that only and instead of this free form like spiraling creativity and expression and a and different type of framework we have a very square like black and white logic mind approach to everything and we're seeing like it's so interesting to see how that plays out in the spiritual path in in science uh you know and in our culture and society as well and the way like even the ways we think even the ways we use language right so all of it is being really affected by that i think and thrown out of balance a bit here for the last few thousands of years (laughs) several thousands of years yes yeah fall of a couple empires and naturally yeah. that'll that'll rise up it, it's, it's again though the society that the religion oftentimes it's a very important part of society and informs specifically mm. with this country i've seen it much more so like just historically speaking with this nation more so than any other one like the religious values really inform the way that everything mm-hmm. else is expressed within that society and 
I think another interesting point that we've seen since about 2000, like with the whole new atheism movement, that early age, you mentioned science. Science itself has been, it's, it's very interesting to look at the way that it's starting to be processed. Our generation, I think, is helping with that a little bit, being a little more open. And you saw a lot of that stuff again with the new atheism movement and whatnot. You have a formal education within the sciences, is that correct? Yeah, like a bit. I mean, I'm doing right now I'm in medical sciences, but I do like holistic medicine, Mm -hmm. but I still had to go through, you know, like that, that stuff as well. Um, But previously to that, I was doing um, in my undergrad, I did nonprofit work, but um, Mm. so a little more like social sciences, but yeah. Undergrad right now. I got you. I understand. (laughs) Yeah. You you switch gears towards the end. I get that. But I mean, even with like one of the things I was curious about, because you have this, uh, Ayurvedic practice that you just opened up and started yeah. doing with your with your brand that you just recently launched and even the counseling which came before it mm-hmm. how did you bridge that gap you know working with the medical sciences like the official established stuff and then transferring <laughs> over to that because you see a lot of criticism between those two things totally um yeah it's very interesting we have a lot of discussions in, in our class about this a lot because it is such a prevalent thing that we do have to deal with um, and we have to learn also how to how to how to bridge that gap, you know, because we want to and we need to because um, whether we like it or not, we're the underdog in the sense that the medical establishment is the power, like the end all be all. So in in, if we don't have, you know, communication and understanding of what we do, we lose, you know, we are the ones that lose. And so we have to learn how to communicate and to integrate, right? Integrative medicine is becoming more and more a thing and although there is a lot of, there is a lot of, um, you know, challenges that we do face in, in our current medical system, um, as mainly I would say, you know, first and foremost, as a lot of probably your listeners and you already know, it's, it's an industry that we're fighting, not health. If we were dealing with a health system, I don't think we would even have an issue, but we're dealing with, <laughs> you know, a, a, a business. And so because it's a business, right? that I think that's where the challenges lie is in the restriction of natural medicine, the pushing of unnatural medicines and pharmaceuticals um, and, you know, interve- really radical interventions because the whole system is based in um, dealing with symptoms, not curing disease. And ours is reverse. Ours is all preventative sciences and reversing of disease. Although we're not even allowed to say those kind of terminology because of it, <laughs> you know, um, that being said, right, that's the challenge, but there is a lot of positive movement that I'm seeing, which I always like to share, which is cool. It's happening. It's more and more like the, it is getting, you know, the the gap is being bridged because I think when there's enough of a majority of the population asking for something, business has to follow, right? Like the, like the model has to follow because it's the demand, right? The consumers demand it. And so because of that, especially like in California, where we are, we're seeing that happen because so many people have now had an interest in alternative medicines and two, they have money (laughs) to do so to explore it. Both of those are facilitating a lot of cool changes like Kaiser Permanente, right? Big hospital chain. They, they accept, you know, Chinese medicine and they do a lot of integrative healthcare, yoga, um, and I think even some energy healing in their hospitals, they allow these science people to come in, which is huge. And there's still a lot we, we, we're not doing yet and we, and we need to work towards, but it's super cool to see that baby steps happening and these things opening, these doorways opening up and, um, and you can find more doctors now. It's all about the personal connection. So if, if, you know, you want to like form relationships with, you know, a primary care doctor, like for what I do. I would want to form, find that find that doctor because there are absolutely times I do need to refer people to Western medicine because it has beautiful aspects too and it has times where it's much needed. So like that, we have to work together and learn how and when to send, you know, and, and work in this harmonious system where I can send somebody there, they can send someone to me, we can send somebody to acupuncture when they need it or to Cairo when they need it, right? So all that kind of stuff. Well, I had no idea that Kaiser was in, like implementing those sorts of things as that's probably the hospital most people know of. Like they're all yeah. by all kinds of different freeways and mm-hmm. that's, that, that's actually really good news to hear. And it 
although it's not totally applicable when you first started speaking, like I heard a bit of a, I don't know if you're too familiar with Scientology being in LA, I'm sure you Mm -hmm. are. That's one of the big slogans that they have. And one of like their covert little organizations is um, like damning the uh, psych, like psychiatric field. Like they have a lot of work about that. Like they they're abusive and all this other stuff it's just a lot of propaganda and whatnot but occasionally even you know a broken clock is right a couple times a day yeah right yeah but <laughs> even, even more so like the the connection between those those fields of medicine i think is great i mean i've i have a couple of friends of mine who i've known since i was a kid and they always express this different view on medicine and even now that we're a little bit older they've taken off in that direction completely and they've really started researching and studying these things Mm. i remember being younger and being handed all these herbs like oh here take this you're feeling you're feeling this thing take this and i'm like what what is this what are you what are you doing it's like we're children you don't know what you're doing and he gave it to me and these sorts of things would actually work and i was (laughs) like okay um wow cool i don't yeah i know right i don't it's like your brother i totally don't (laughs) understand what's going on here but you're starting to see a little bit more of a boom there. And yeah. although I consider myself personally a layman, I don't really understand a whole lot about those things. It is really exciting as someone who does appreciate and venerate like ancient mm-hmm. cultures and ancient ways. Yeah. And I think it's a little ironic that you were saying being accepted within Western medicine, despite the practices being so much older. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. Like historically you know, verified they're being used for thousands of years. There's some applicability yeah. there. I know. And that's, that's the thing, right? It's so funny that, and that's like kind of why I had mentioned earlier how science has become, um, in my opinion, really unscientific in a lot of ways, because it's also just as dogmatic in a lot of its ideas and theories that used to be like this, the whole point was it's an open questioning, right? It's an open questioning constantly of the evolution of what we understand about the universe and the laws that run it and all of that stuff and i and i feel that with that 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 framework has now been put on medicine in the sense that we think our way of verifying something working or not working is the way to verify even though there's so many ways to verify right for example placebo right or a double blind study this is how we we prove research in the western system that that a medication works or not but can you do a placebo with acupuncture? Like, no, that doesn't even apply to that system. You can't even use that because you're putting needles in somebody's body. You're not taking a pill. So like this, there's just, there's so many ways we need to be able to expand our ideas of what it means to prove something and understand that there are so many systems which have absolutely proven themselves in so many other ways. And, um, And even sometimes in the ways that we're looking for too. But these systems, yeah, like Ayurveda, right? What I do has been, it's the oldest medical system in the world. Um, It's over 6,000 years old. um, And the origin of surgery is from Ayurveda. Even the techniques that are still used in plastic surgery today and other surgeries like rhinoplasty and all these things are from Ayurveda. And yet when you look on Wikipedia, I just found this out like a few weeks ago. When you look on Wikipedia, I was so flabbergasted by this, by the way, because it's like an absolutely accepted science in, even in the US, like we're allowed to practice this. And on Wikipedia, it says that Ayurveda is a pseudoscience and it's considered quackery by the Indian Medical Association. And like, that is the paragraph on Ayurveda on Wikipedia page. And I was like, how is this even allowed to be on the internet? This is so abusive and so wrong. Like, so tragic that that that's even there but I mean I know Wikipedia is not the source of everything but a lot of people read that right so it's interesting it's interesting that we we try so hard to shove down these really powerful systems of healing that like have proven themselves right I can trust that you know there's there's a new I was really confused being super passionate about health and nutrition for many years it's a very confusing industry to be in because you are constantly being told contradictory information, right? You'll be told one day that, you know, taking this supplement is really good for you or taking supplements is terrible for you. You should drink water. No, you actually shouldn't. It's causing swelling. No, you should eat these fruits and vegetables. Oh no, actually they cause mucus in the body. Oh, you should, you know, have a lot of carbs. No, carbs are really bad for you. You know, it's always 
fluctuating. Mm -hmm. So I felt like coming back to the source, coming back to an ancient tradition, what it opened up for me was this transcendence of all of that ups and downs and confusion, because I'm like, hey, if this has worked for 6,000 years, for millions, if not billions of people who have come through that system over those thousands of years, I'm going to trust that versus something which has been tested for five or even 15 or even 20, because we don't know long term, we don't know long term effects sometimes. And so a lot of what we talk about and discuss in the nutrition and health industry is very short term. And they might have even done a study and seen what happens to your cell, but they don't know 100 years from now what that impact is, right? So that's why I kind of, I'm like, let me go back to this ancient one and see what they have to say and, and kind of cross check it because that, that gives me more of a peace of mind of what I do. Well, it kind of, this can come right back around to what we were saying a little while ago. It, it's business. It's a lot harder to monetize something like an ancient practice of medicine, just the same way it's a lot easier to monetize a Christian or Catholic church than it is a mm -hmm. monastery or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to do that. It's a lot easier to get people to give you money for something. Of, of course, I'm not even surprised that the oh, pseudoscience or <laughs> quackery or whatever it is, it's like just it's because your system and, and this is something that I have been speaking about quite a bit with like just in personal conversations is kind of the, the battle between our perception of uh, spirituality here and comparing that to the old ways. It's sort of mm. the same issue that you run into yeah. is um, fighting against this system, which is supposed to be open-minded, you know, the whole scientific process and that sort of thing, like verifying, is this true? Do we have evidence for this? It's like, well, yes, of course you have evidence for this thing, but this system, it doesn't apply to it. Just like you were saying with acupuncture, you can't really test it here. This is something that requires a different set of rules than the ones mm -hmm. that you can prove in a laboratory setting. Yeah. It's a yeah, lot more, exactly. It's a lot more difficult to get into that. I mean, you were describing that you're, what led you to the Ayurvedic system, mm -hmm. just the fact that it's been verified for so long. Does that, uh, and that can apply as well to spiritual practice and with like meditation and things like that. Mm. How did you, I know you mentioned in Ecuador, that's when you initially started with the meditation. What information did you have when you started? Because I think that's something I've spoken to a lot of people about is like, how, how do you get started doing this? Like, there are so many different ways to do it. How do you start out? And what information did you have when you started out? Yeah, I had no information when I started <laughs> out, um, honestly. And so what I started with was just doing guided meditations on YouTube. It was all over the place. I wasn't like in one system um, or, you know, I had a lot of like lack of tools or education on it. I kind of was just like, I got to start doing this. You know, I need to do this for myself. I really want to try this out. So I started just, I was, you know, I'd be like meditation on for anxiety, meditation for releasing, you know, stress, whatever it was that I was like that day I wanted to focus in and I would just YouTube it. And I would watch a guided meditation. And even that brought me, of course, like a lot of, a lot of healing and peace. But I would say that definitely once I had the actual like systems and knowledge on that and the source of how to really use these practices as a science and um, do them to a next level depth, you know, than just like a guided meditation that somebody else is leading you through um, was really when like the transformation started happening at a way different level. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, that was when I initially started. I had a friend at the time, like some time ago, who was like, oh, you should go to this uh, this place, this monastery I, I used to go to. You should go check it out if you're looking at getting started with meditation. I'm like, okay, cool. I show up and I'm immediately intimidated. I no idea what's going on. All these statues, which I'm aware of, I know, yeah. like I've done some research and study, but it's different to actually be in the environment with, yeah. as a Westerner with this uh, culture that you don't know a whole lot about, but being accepted and none like all the same, like, mm -hmm. no, you're welcome here. You, you, you belong here. And over time you start growing that sort of sense of awareness within yourself. Like you see with meditation. It's one of those things, like, again, back to the medicine thing, it's hard to quantify. It's something yeah. that you experience within yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you don't really know what you're looking for, it can be difficult to quantify it. And as Westerners, we want to see progress. I, I need yeah. to know that I'm getting better at this thing. It's like you, it's not something you get better at. It's something that you become more and more the yeah. more that you do it. Yes, that's so true. I think that that's also where like kind of what you mentioned way, like the very beginning, um, how we've kind of, you know, corrupted a lot of these systems in the sense that 
because we have these ideas or objectives with what they should be and what we want to get from them is very different than what they are and what they can actually give us. <laughs> but we, we are looking for, yeah, tangibility. Uh, I, like if I'm not immediately seeing like this, some type of result my mind can comprehend, I don't want to do it. And so now because we, we function like that in general as a, as a collective consciousness of our society, businesses tailor to that. So they're like, Hey, let's, let's make this more tangible. We're going to make an app for meditation that literally is like, you do this every day, five minutes, and you will, you know, reduce stress by 5% and you can see your heart rate and you can check your diagnostics and that's how you know it's working, right? So it's a very physical level. And yes, the, yeah. these are true. Like these are true things. Awesome stuff happens to your body with meditation. Awesome stuff happens to your body with yoga. But <laughs> there's something so much beyond that, which is supposed to be a part of it and happening that we're ripping out because it doesn't fit that and mm -hmm. it's not tangible and it's not comfortable for a lot of people's belief systems. And so they're like, Oh, let's just get rid of the belief systems and take the practices. So now we're, we're just going to absolutely rip out all of the tradition and heritage, not acknowledge where it comes from or the lineage of it, not acknowledge the spiritual spirituality and the belief system behind it and just use it how we want. Right. That is kind of what has been happening. <laughs> which is tragic in its own way. But. <laughs> um, absolutely. I immediately thought, because I did the same thing. I think like a lot of us do. Like I downloaded the app and I didn't even really know why I wanted to do it. Like the guided meditations are nice, but I wasn't really coming to it for the guided meditation. I was coming mm -hmm. to it for when that five minutes was up. I opened my eyes and I see a green little check mark. I'm like, yeah. yes, I did something. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's not. I meditated so today. Check. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I meditated today, but it's not so you'd think just knowing that you did it would be enough, but it's like, no, I needed to see that little check mark yeah. and that made me feel good about myself. It's like, again, it's sort of the long term goal versus like long term mm -hmm. delayed gratification as opposed to gratification here in the moment, which I think is if you could yeah. take one principle and apply it to all spiritual systems, that's one that can apply to all of them. Mm -hmm. The short term gratification as opposed to you know, long term yeah. satisfaction. It's like if you're mm -hmm. addicted to seeing that, uh, you can, of course, even if you're meditating five minutes a day and you use these little apps and they, they have their place and they're good, they, they should be a yeah. starting point. But exactly. eventually, <laughs> if you don't let go of your attachment to that, you're going to become addicted to the check marks and not yeah. the actual yeah. practice. You lose, yeah, you lose the essence of, of the, the why, actually, right? It's more like I'm doing it to do it just like I was doing with everything else in my life. And it becomes like an autopilot versus a, conscious awareness which is the entire point of the of the practice is like only bringing awareness but it's funny because we then fall into the unawareness with it too because it becomes habit and then mm -hmm. we're like ah, I'm, I'm that's just the routine now <laughs> and yeah. then we're not we lose that presence again so we always have to remind ourselves of coming back into that you know no matter what no matter where we're at that's actually true like we always have to remind, give ourselves those reminders because we'll fall into it at some point or another and we have to just oh let me we got to bring that awareness back i'm feeling like that i'm feeling that stuck energy you know or i'm feeling that like stagnation i need to re reinfuse that life back into what i'm doing you know which is almost a little ironic because it's almost circular it's like w without yeah. the without the level of awareness that you attain by being you know a, a big constantly meditating and becoming aware of yourself and of your sensations and all these things and just mm -hmm. even the world you become a little more analytical and you start seeing how things move that within itself is going to grant you the ability to realize when you're falling out of it so it's like yeah. you can use that awareness to bring yourself back up and <laughs> <Precisely>. that's <laughs> so i did want to i want to mention because i think i get a, a different answer to this no matter who you like speak with whether like whatever spiritual tradition you uh follow most of them i think a lot of them in like uh bring meditation about in some way or another in some mm. form or another mm -hmm. how would you quantify that in terms of like how do you you practice meditation daily you get like you said in this routine how do you quantify meditating like how does it affect you on a day-to-day -day level like how do you how does that go yeah so basically i was just saying like that i think it completely depends on your intention um i think that what you intend for you 
you find. So if your intention is stress relief, you can absolutely and will find that with, with doing meditation. If your intention is just trying to like reduce your thoughts or, you know, kind of have peace of mind, you can also achieve that. Um, if your intention is like a cosmic union, that's another thing. And you can also achieve that. So for me, that is the intention really ultimately is actually having a, a, a cosmic connection to myself or, you know, uh, that, that divinity that is within and without and tapping into that source and tapping into that awareness of who I truly am beyond all these identities that I have or that I hold because I feel like that is a necessity to bring ourselves into that for sustainable bliss and sustainable peace. I think that that only comes from constantly reminding ourselves of who we really are because all the suffering comes from thinking we are the emotional experiences we're having or that we are the the thoughts that we're, we can't stop having or we are the body or we are this personality and so I think meditation is there to remind us of what we are beyond that and we can actually taste that and feel it and carry that into our day-to-day -day lives so that we are witnessing you know witnessing what's happening to us but we don't feel it's happening to us we get to watch watch the game and watch the play and feel empowered to create whatever that we want and experience whatever that we want um, without feeling like a victim of circumstance, you know? It, that's really interesting. I think it comes down to like all the philosophy from like the which stoicism, which is one of the other systems that's seeing like a really big revival right now, as well as like a Hindu tradition and Buddhist tradition and pagan traditions too kind of comes down to even with meditation but with other practices too whether you're like you're doing a working of some kind like candle work or something along those lines awareness and perception are the two yeah. most core pieces <laughs> that unite all of these different systems like yeah. I, there, there was someone i spoke to recently who said that uh, the same thing is like you will find within each tradition if you look at it and you study it you'll find that each one of these traditions will hit upon the same key points. They just go about achieving them in a different way yep. or they use those key points to condemn like we do here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but it all comes down to awareness and perception. I, I just had a conversation last week with someone who was uh, practicing meditation, but he started out his spiritual path with psychedelics and mm -hmm. he almost described it as like a, a cheat code. It's like, I can ascend this way or I think it's just a different path, but he, the same I asked him the same question like how do you how do you go about practicing this like what do you get out of it and he said the same thing intention it's like what you show up and yeah. intend to get from it is going to heavily influence what you get out yeah. of it only I think this is unifying principle between psychedelic practice and meditation too and of course I like to hear what you have to say about that is um, sometimes when you approach it and I've experienced this myself you can have this intention like I want to relieve my anxiety yeah. But when you get deeper and deeper into it, you start realizing that your anxiety that you're trying to eliminate is caused by this or that mm -hmm. thing that you weren't initially aware of. So yeah. even though you're approaching it with this intention, ultimately you are going to relieve that if you continue down this path, but you're going to discover something that you didn't know was actually yeah. inhibiting your peace there. Yeah. Oh, I think that's true. I think that is true. I think that we, like, I think it's the ultimate proof if anything, right? If you really think about it, that we are, we are God in our own lives because we literally experience what we decide for. Mm -hmm. So what, and it doesn't mean it's going to happen instantly. That's where people get hung up because they're like, oh, I'm intending to relieve my anxiety and I'm feeling really anxious every time I meditate. <laughs> yes, our timeline might be different, <laughs> yeah. but eventually I would guarantee that you are going to experience that at some point. But I think you're right in the sense that also there's a there's a mysticism to life which we don't necessarily always can wrap our minds around and control and understand which is the most beautiful part that surrender that so um i think that basically whatever like we when we're in that flow of life life is always going to keep showing us what we need and leading us leading us to more and more expansion like i really believe that there there's no escaping the nature of life, right? Which is like, 
is it's the same as in physics like we're always expanding you can't stop the energy from expanding or moving somewhere and so just like that i think we do get led into these higher experiences also because the more we we actually are aware and present we're gonna uh, you know get through these layers get through these layers and see deeper into ourselves and the cause of things in our life and the, the deeper solutions and the deeper connection will start to kind of unfold itself mm -hmm. And that's a quote of sort of a key principle behind the meditation or spiritual practice and like the hermetic school as well. Like the yeah. vibrational kind of thing about, about that whole thing, like vibrations and the differences between uh, matter and energy and God consciousness and all these different things. I think it's interesting to note too, that one thing that also links those practices together is as you move through these layers, there can be layers of vibration. You're just moving through them mm -hmm. and eventually you will achieve this, God consciousness or being aware of the, like what this actually is and finding the divinity within yourself that can kind of come in contact though, or come in conflict actually with our, like with a lot of Western practitioners in terms of like how they express their spirituality. Yeah. We often, we're kind of programmed to view divinity as being per as also being perfection. Like they're one yeah. and the same it has to be perfect. You can't even conceive of the word <laughs> God inherently means perfect and all knowing yeah. and omniscient. But all these other traditions throughout, like all over the world perceive and conceive of gods in different ways like within yeah. uh, my own pagan practice. They're not perfect. They mm -hmm. have, and this can be taken back to the rates of vibration. There is ultimately this unifying thing mm -hmm. that connects everything together. And that can't like that perfection does exist somewhere. I wouldn't call it yeah. perfection because it exists beyond <laughs> that. Yeah, but exactly. exactly the gods you have behind you on your wall and the ones that I also venerate too, they don't exist to be perfect and yes. they exist as teachers and we are their students. We're not their slaves and they are not yes. our masters. It's a big, yeah, that I think is the hardest thing to break through when you're, um, when you're discussing West East modalities, um, or even like you said, I would say Abraham like religions uh, versus those that are more indigenous tradition um, is that concept. That's the hardest one to gel. And that's why, um, although I absolutely believe that all paths, like so much diversity in paths exists for a reason. And because there are so many, you know, un absolutely unique beings and souls and consciousnesses that connect in different ways is one thing but i will also be the person to tell you that all religions are not the same i don't agree with that i do not agree with that that statement because there are some fundamental principles which are really differing in understanding and i think one of the biggest ones is the being separate from god that's the hardest thing to bridge because it's innately very strongly told that we are separate from god we cannot be what he is what it is and that 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 can't be that can't you can't entangle in that space and um and so so yeah i think there is like although i would argue that like at the root is different what what the what jesus actually taught was different than that but that's a whole nother story <laughs> what the actual belief system the organized belief system is consistently teaching that that is not the case can be a hard thing to gel with because i think that's where we see resistance to things like yoga and meditation being taught in the West and why they are being, I would use the term culturally appropriated and used how people want to use them for that. I think a lot of the reason in, in a lot of cases is because they're talking to a Christian audience. And so they strip out, Oh, you mean if you practice yoga, you're already acknowledging that, you know, you exist as pure consciousness and you are doing this practice to connect to the divinity that lies within you that makes people uncomfortable and so they stop saying it and they start watering everything down and they start stripping away the the entire like foundation of what it is you know and so i think that's kind of what i at least what i witness playing out and i'm not saying that's the only reason but i see it being a part of it um you know well yeah, of course. I, I, I've been talking about that. Uh, I've been thinking about that. It's been on my mind a lot recently is just how much more difficult it all comes down to control. And I think when it comes to like mm -hmm. specifically with Abrahamic religions, Christianity, we can say, because that's the biggest one here. 
uh, when you get these indigenous cultures that have all the like pantheistic, they have all these different practices yeah. and there is a freedom there. So if you can belong to, like, let's just use like uh, any different nation spirituality, say Norse paganism. Yeah. There are about a million different ways to practice that. There are a million different ways with a million different ideas and you are free to choose. It's, it's yeah. entirely up to you as opposed to the system that we have here, which is very streamlined. There's a lot of different variations and interpretations, but they all are built around the same principle. Yeah. You do these things, you follow what we say. It's, it's very structured. It's very organized. And I think it's more, it operates more as a social and political organization mm -hmm. and tool more so than a spiritual one yeah because it relies so heavily on control it relies so heavily on being able to monetize this make money and pump that in right back into the community which can be a good thing ultimately of course it can but if the system is built around subservience yeah. and submission and mm. that separation from god like you look at the origin story yeah. we were put on yeah. the eve inherent separation you yeah. are not this especially yeah. not women you came from him especially mm -hmm. not you guys this yeah. this is inherent separation which can be looked at as a reaction to the indigenous cultures and a way of getting control for of them sure. too for sure yeah. i think that that was integrated because yeah i was just it was funny i was just talking about this too that um i think there is a difference in the sense that these ancient traditions they've been existing for so long and so inherently tied to just human nature in general i would argue mm -hmm what we inherently are drawn to, the stories that we tell, the way that we really, really do live as spiritual beings, whether we're, we're, you know, we're disconnected from that at this point, but I do believe that. And I think you can see that when you look at all these cultures around the world and so much that they do have in common when you go back to the, the origin and the source of the way that they live and what they believed. Whereas Christianity was recently created and it was created very purposefully at a time and if you just look at the political climate it tells you everything you need to know about what was happening and why that was created and what it the tool that it was used for in the hands of who it was used you know by is it, it shows you the, the the source is very different I would I would argue um, whereas if we're just if we were just talking about you know and that's again not to say like if we were just looking at the prophets or at Jesus that's a different story we're talking about that organization like you said it's a more much more of a political structure than anything power and it's extremely powerful and has been for so long in terms of the wealth the property the money and the even political power it holds over the last few thousand years that it's you know even if it didn't even start in the way that it did it would been, have been very corrupted at this point you know so but it's, it's interesting, like you were saying, to look at that open framework, right? And that's what I do love so much about all of these other diverse traditions that we don't hear about, <laughs> because it's so beautiful. There is so much freedom. You can connect in a, you know, a million different ways, and, and that's all okay. Like, there's no conflict. It sounds like a paradox to a Western mentality, where if you tell them you can be an atheist Hindu, you can be a Hindu that only believes in praying to, you know, into to Krishna. You can be a Hindu that only believes in praying to the, the goddess. You can be a Hindu who doesn't connect to any gods or goddesses and rejects the forms and only connects through nature. Mm. All of that is included within the umbrella of Hinduism because it's not a religion, like in the term that we're used to. So it's just like this, this open framework and and yeah, these, these beings, there's so many different beings, higher dimensional beings, you could call them that are represented as these gods or goddesses or kind of angelic type beings or masters or yogis. And all of them are at these different um, vibrations and like different places on the path. And that's what's so cool is like that, even that discovery to me that was so fascinating that like there wasn't just making it, like you don't just get enlightened and that's it there's like all of these like tears like that's only the beginning like you as a human being can reach this like god awareness or self-realization and then there are like so many different layers and dimensions you could get to right like you read about certain gods and goddesses that seem more human like than others mm -hmm. because it's like they're at a certain point where they still might have some type of that level of consciousness mixed with this higher level awareness and then you have these beings that you can you can read about or, or connect to that are very much beyond the human comprehension 
that might seem a little more perfected if you want to use that word but they're they're they've like they're transcended right so there's all these different like exp embodiments and expansions and it's so cool and it's so cool and you and you can connect and you can also as you know in that concept of oneness you can achieve those things as well as you go through your evolution you know definitely I, there's also this like kind of with the whole freedom aspect too within these indigenous cultures it's not structured in a way that is meant to dominate or control which allows that freedom and, and an aspect of that freedom too is sort of the the belief that these consciousnesses and these uh, beings divinity whatever whatever label you want to put on it nature has a yeah. way of communicating in a way mm -hmm. differently to everybody. It's not uh, this one streamlined sort of way yeah. that you, you do this thing, you get an answer or you don't. It's like, no, it, it, these, they're so infinitely complex. We're not even, tr we're not going to try and label them. And we understand <laughs> that they do like for me personally, my experience is like the, my, my patron deity is uh, Freya and oh, wow, the, cool. the level of, and I've heard this a lot too. Like oh, they, they'll communicate, they communicate in different ways they choose you and they communicate in ways that you're probably not always going to understand. But if you know, or have this level of awareness, you can see it happen. And within, yeah, so cool. yeah, and once I became aware of that, I saw it happen. And then you're, you're meeting other people like, wait, you had that happen too. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I had that happen too. And they're like, no way. But what for me, it happened this way. It's like, yeah. and there's this level of acceptance that you have for each other. Totally. Because you're not holding each other to your own standard. It's like, I'm holding you to my definition of this deity. So if it doesn't fall under this banner, or if you happen to fall out of this socially accepted class, you're now an outsider. It doesn't work yeah. that way. Because yeah. we understand that it's so much more complex than that. We understand that this process of life is a continuous cycle. It's mm -hmm. not a matter of being saved or you're going to be punished forever. It's a matter yeah. of, yeah. yeah, it's a matter of, well, I guess if you screw up this time, I'll see you again in a couple thousand <laughs> years. And the life cycle just, <laughs> just continues. It never ends. Yeah, you just have to, that's the thing, right? Like, <laughs> I think my, one time my guru said, he was like, you can, you can uh, keep doing the same thing, or, like keep, keep making the same choice. You're the one who's going to have to keep reliving it. <laughs> it's like, it's true. There's not like an outside presence or system, which is here to punish us. It's all about our choices and our decisions to either stay in something that is no longer serving us and causing some type of suffering or resistance or going to that path of least resistance and and shedding those things or maybe making the ne the next choice you know and and evolving in that way and it's all that's the whole concept of karma that's all it is there's no outside system punishment like oh you kicked somebody now you're gonna get kicked no it's the principle that we are all one consciousness in many different forms so naturally when we do inflict violence even internally, we're going to see it externally and vice versa, because it's a law of life, just like a law of energy, right? It never gets destroyed. And so when you put something out there, it's always going to be there and it's going to express in all these different ways. And we choose, yeah, we have to choose how we want to, how we want to go forward. And like, <laughs> if we want to live in our patterns, if we want to stop living in those patterns. Yeah. Just the the way that we can quantify and you were all you know, we were kids, we were hearing about karma and it's like, oh I kick you, you're gonna get kicked if it it's just so foolish yeah. to sit back. Like once you actually look at it and look at the tradition, look at the source, you're like, Oh, yeah. that's not actually what it is. It's not that simple. Like just just hearing it, just the way that we like, I, I think cultural appropriation is absolutely a valid term there. Because you're just taking this, yeah. this ancient thing that has been, existed for an indefinable amount of time and you're like okay let's take it here this doesn't make sense to me let's rewrite that real quick and put it in a yeah. way that makes sense i can i can say this in a couple sentences here that works yeah Which, oh it's so frustrating to hear about once you actually have yeah. even a, an idea of how this works totally but oh that's frustrating yeah it's all like trying to make it digestible mm -hmm. and there's, there's a thing because it's like yes there has to be a balance like we do have to be able to speak to people's listening so there's a difference between doing that and and actually taking away the core of what something is based on our laziness or our will or our wanting to whitewash it you know to make it okay for every comfortable for everybody even though it's not supposed to be like it's not supposed to be comfortable for everybody it doesn't need to be comfortable for everybody like you know that 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 I think fundamental belief too has caused a lot of what we're seeing now in our in our culture too it's like even with ourselves right 
that idea that like we as as individuals are supposed to make everybody comfortable you know and the way that we parent and the way that we educate children teaches them that that we should always make people comfortable and we should always stay in those zones right instead of being really just what we are and expressing what we really feel and and living in that truthfulness is okay like we don't we don't always have to agree and that also doesn't mean we have to have have war or tension you can just disagree and we can all be these unique expressions you know and i think we're moving towards that i think we'll we'll see more of that as we get older you know and then in the next generations of children i i hope and i i, I want to hold that space <laughs> yeah maybe in 40 years you can look back and be like oh yeah we were right we had an idea we were getting yeah. closer and we're being more yeah. open and accepting these other traditions and being aware again awareness and perception being able to tell and look at these different systems and see the way that they inform mm-hmm. the way we treat other people that's ultimately yeah. what it comes down to in our day-to-day relations with each other I think just sort of round out on like one of my favorite like aspects of spirituality is the fact that it's not comfortable. It's something that is incredibly difficult to push through at times. It's something specifically with meditation. A lot of times you hit a roadblock with it or you get frustrated. You have to sacrifice something to attain a level of vibration, to attain a different level of consciousness, whatever, however you want to put it sacrifice is at the core of all spiritual practice and all traditions essentially. So my favorite question to ask really is what, where you are now being 25, just turned 25, you're just at the beginning of this, just getting started, just like me. What have you felt you've had to sacrifice up until this point to attain the position in life that you have now? Hmm. Yeah, I totally resonate with that. I think that is true. Um, You do have to shed things. Although I think I like have come into the space where I don't feel like it's, it, it, I need to perceive it as a sacrifice, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Because, I've, because once you're on the other side, you realize that, that whatever you let go of was not you to begin with, um, is, what, is what, I, what, I, what I feel. But in the moment, it feels absolutely like, it can feel absolutely like a torture or, <laughs> or a sacrifice at times where you feel something being ripped away. I would say for me, the biggest thing being the person that I was, um, the personality that I was as, you know, as a child was so desiring normalcy. And whether that was, you know, instilled in me by society, who knows, probably majority of it was, there was a strong part of me that believed I wanted normalcy and stability in my life. I wanted to have I just wanted to be normal. And I think a lot of that too was like my childhood, my dad was an addict and we had a pretty hectic childhood. So I think I craved that in some way or another. So for me, I think on the path, the biggest thing I've had to continuously bring awareness to and let go of to the resistance to is constantly accepting that I am not normal and I'm never going to be normal. And that's also a beautiful thing. And my life is never going to look all these ways that I thought it might have, you know, 10 years ago. And that I'm constantly going to have to be changing and I'm never going to be the same person accepting that and accepting what that means in terms of maybe losing certain, you know, sensual comforts or pleasures um, or certain relationship dynamics you know, being easy, uh, being the easy person in social gatherings, like, you know, all of that I I held on to, I did, like, I wanted, I didn't want to stand out, and I didn't want to be the one that was, like, the weird one, or, like, the one that doesn't want to drink, or the one that doesn't want to eat that, or the one that is going to talk to you about deep stuff, you know, (laughs) and so for me, I think it was, it was the sacrificing of those, like, identities that I really was clutching strongly onto that felt very painful, in the moment to shed them and sometimes still does i still see that coming up of course and i think that will come up until i'm actually enlightened <laughs> you know and i've totally completely transcended the the connection between you know those those identities but so worthwhile every time because every time you get through it you feel absolutely even more liberated and way more blissful than you did before but in that middle period it's like ah yeah. it's this death process it is it's a death process that you have to go through that was very well put. I mean, being not wanting to be the weird one is one that I, I can definitely relate to, although it was the complete opposite. 
I was a kid in uh, like high school age, 14, 15, kind of this, like you mentioned your brother. I was like, yeah. oh, trip down memory lane, sort of the same thing. <laughs> I was the one who was wearing knee-high leather boots. I was the one that was wearing makeup. I was the one that had, awesome. I, I grew my hair out like it was halfway down my back. I was always the one that stood out, and I really yeah. enjoyed that. Mm. But sort of the same way you can get addicted to the green check mark, you can get yeah. addicted to standing out as opposed to the substance so of what makes you stand out. Mm -hmm. So that, that within itself is sort of being, not necessarily, because you don't start out wanting the attention, but you attract it by yeah. being weird, by just being yourself. But if you're not aware of that, you're not aware of why you are the way that you are, you will yeah. become a attached to the wrong things. Yes. Though it's funny, just the, the contrast there. No, it's a, but, it's a great point. It's true. It's true. <laughs> but I, I love, I just love the fact that you, you say that too. Like once you get to a certain point, it doesn't even really feel like sacrifice. And I think that's a great thing to to close out on. Just the fact that when you, commit yourself to the spiritual tradition, whatever spiritual tradition you have to happen to commit yourself to, um, at least the cool ones, the ones that we've been talking about. <laughs> but like, you're, you're going to find a lot of these same unifying principles, but awareness and perception are key and making yeah. sure that you're focusing on the right things and not being attached to the ego or a lot of these extemporaneous things that you're defining yourself as being. You know, look within, search within, and find the uh, consciousness within the, di the divinity within you're not going to find it anywhere else yes exactly it's all within it's all within man <laughs> it's all within that's a great way to close out just for anybody that wants to find you anywhere uh, the, the things that you've been up to you've been up to a lot of things we definitely could keep on going i have to do this again sometime and speak about those <laughs> yeah, things yeah we can but... totally do it again and of course. yeah of course yeah so basically you can find me um, at Kundalini Yogini on most stuff. Uh, my YouTube, my TikTok, Instagram is Kundalini Yogini Prasita, but you'll, it'll still pop up if you just type Kundalini Yogini, so that's always easier. Um, and my website is Ananda Ayurveda, so that's my company if you're interested in getting any powerful herbal medicines and or doing a consultation with me one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Perfect. There's not a whole lot of people that go by that name, so you won't be too hard to find. Yeah, but exactly. <laughs> really appreciate you coming on. We'll do this again sometime. Definitely. There's always ground you can always cover, but it was a great talk. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. It was so fun. And we will, we'll chat soon. <laughs>